Hello and welcome. One of the most sought after speakers at the World Economic Forum in Davos this year, as is the case almost every year, is well known historian and economist Neil Ferguson. One of the reasons for that is that nobody can look at uh, modern events and give it the kind of historical arc that uh, Neil Ferguson can. Thank you so much, Neil Ferguson, for joining us. And with me in this conversation is India Today's Managing Director and Vice Chair Kali Puri. Kali, welcome. Thank you. It's so nice to have you back with us, Neil. The last time we met was 2011 but at the India Day Conclave. Today we've connected back and it feels as if I'm meeting an old friend. Except you don't look old, you look very young. We will get know. to your anti-aging <laughs> secrets, but before that, what has changed since we met you last in 2011 in the world and in India? Give us some broad strokes. Well, in, back in 2011 when we last met, I was talking about the fundamental problems of American power and of Western civilization, and I even made the old uh, joke about Western civilization that Mahatma Gandhi made in the 1930s when he said it would be a very good idea. So my arguments then were, <laughs> A, there's a problem with American power, and the problem is that it, the United States does not really want to run an empire, and yet it finds itself deploying troops all over the world uh, with a mounting debt and a fundamental lack of political enthusiasm. This was the kind of backlash against Iraq and Afghanistan that was already obvious back in 2011. Uh, fast forward to 2024, uh, we've had uh, two presidents uh, since then. Uh, we've had Donald Trump and now we have Joe Biden. We may be getting Donald Trump again. What's interesting is that no matter who the president is, whether it's Obama or Trump or Biden, they have the same problem. They would like not to be involved in faraway places with problems, whether it's Ukraine or Israel, or for that matter, Taiwan, but they just can't walk away. So that I don't think has changed. If anything, the problem's got worse because the debt has got bigger. And I think the public appetite for what they now call forever wars has got even less than it was in 2011. Now, one of the things that was said about the modern day world is that we are moving away from the kind of wars that we saw during World War I, World War II, physical military aggression. And then Russia invaded Ukraine, and now we've got Israel uh, versus Hamas. How do you see this play out in a historical arc, given that the general sense was that we won't see these kind of physical ground battles that we're seeing right now? Well, I think that was a delusion of what I'm going to call the interwar period between Cold War I and Cold War II. I think we've been in Cold War II now for the last five years or so, but it's taken people a while. Many of the assumptions of the 1990s and 2000s, I think, were false, that we'd sort of left behind the days of large-scale conventional conflict. And I don't think that was ever really true. Admittedly, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan were relatively small uh, by the standards of the 20th century, but it wasn't as if the Russians had uh, got rid of their tanks. And when they deployed them uh, against Ukraine in February of 2022, many people were shocked. Uh, I was one of the few people who had consistently predicted that that was going to happen at the beginning of 2022. Israel probably has another war to fight against Hezbollah, potentially in the next couple of months. And hanging over the world, there is, of course, the threat of a U.S.-China conflict over Taiwan, which would be a much, much bigger deal than any of these other wars. So the world is, has left behind the peace dividend. We're no longer in that interwar period when we thought uh, that we'd left behind nuclear threats. Putin made those threats on more than one occasion since he invaded Ukraine. And I think we're all gradually adjusting our uh, sights to that. And you see that here at Davos. This has been the high temple of globalization for decades. Uh, but the, the, the themes this year are fragmentation. And you find more and more of the conversations are about conflicts. I was at a dinner last night. The number one co topic of conversation was Israel. Number two was Ukraine. What about the fact that some of the myths about Russia and Israel have been broken through this war as well? About, you know, this uh, amazing Israeli intelligence and Russian um, military power. That hasn't really played out. Well, yes and no. I think it's true that the Russians performed dismally in the opening phase of the war. In fact, they lost the Battle of Kyiv spectacularly. But since then, I think the tide has turned in Russia's favor. And one can see this very clearly in the fact that they now outgun 
the Ukrainians in terms of artillery. They're waging an air war against Ukraine that is really proving very difficult to withstand with the air defenses Ukraine has. And so one has the uneasy feeling that the tide has turned in Putin's favor. And ultimately, although it opened badly, as in many previous wars, Russia is uh, able to step up just because of the raw resources that it has in the second phase of the war. Israel's intelligence failed not because nobody knew Hamas was going to attack, but because the people in charge in Israel chose to ignore the warnings. And I think future historians will wonder why that was. Uh, why Bibi Netanyahu, who had for so long uh, had, had a reputation for toughness, missed something that was, as far as people watching closely were concerned, fairly obvious. Uh, so that some of the people I know uh, who are experts in the region had been warning throughout last year, prior to October the 7th, that something bad was coming. The mystery is that those at the top of the Israeli government missed it. In Russia's long march, how does Putin's invasion of Ukraine impact how the world sees Russia and where Russia potentially goes from here? Could Putin now win, you think? He could. Uh, I'm going after this interview to a session uh, with Ukrainian uh, representatives, and the topic uh, of the discussion will be, what if Ukraine loses? You know, last year, nobody was talking about that. People would debate, you know, how quickly can Ukraine win, and how, how big will its counteroffensive be? And people would s sort of talk as if the worst case scenario was a stalemate. And I've been saying for a while, you have to remember, there's a, an even worse scenario than that, and that's a scenario of Russian victory. And that's not inconceivable. Russia could launch an offensive this summer in 2024, gain even more territory. The more territory it gains, especially in the south, the harder it will be for Ukraine to be viable after that. So I think we're in a very, very dangerous phase of this war. People in the United States and in Europe have to get real because they cannot afford to let Russia win this war. The costs would be enormous. That would create a whole new set of threats for, for Western Europe that we haven't had to live with since the end of the Cold How War. How could that impact Europe and the NATO project? Well, I think right now, Europeans have been talking for years about strategic autonomy. The difference is they, they have to do something about it now. That means they have to spend more on defense. 2% of gross domestic product is supposed to be the target. Many NATO countries don't even spend that. Historically, it's a low number. Uh, they really need to spend more than 2% of GDP on defense, particularly if Russia is on their borders, which for Poland it would be if Ukraine were to be utterly defeated. So this is a really, really critical moment in European history. I think a lot of people talk the talk about Ukraine after the initial invasion. Uh, and I, I'm struck by the fact that those people who were so ready to back Ukraine in 2022 have sort of lost interest now to the point that American money has ceased to flow to Ukraine. Last year, people would say, oh, it would be terrible if Donald Trump were re-elected because funds for Ukraine would be cut off. Guess what? They've already been cut off, and we're 10 months away from the presidential election. What's most likely to happen in the Middle East, given that Israel continues to pound Hamas? 70% of northern Gaza has already been raised to the ground. Uh, we're seeing the Houthis constantly attacked shipping being impacted in the way that it is. You, you spoke of a potential escalation with the Hezbollah. Is that highly likely in your view? I think it is likely. It's hard for me to believe that Hezbollah will just sit polishing their rockets and missiles indefinitely. Those are not there just to be looked at. At some point they're going to be used. But remember... What, what could they be waiting for? Well, the critical thing here is Iran. The Biden administration acts like this is nothing to do with Iran, like Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad and the Houthis. They just kind of do these things spontaneously of their own accord. But in reality, Iran is behind all of these proxies. And with Iran's impunity, they can continue to operate. The big mistake I think the Biden administration made was not to make Iran pay for the actions of Hamas. And until Iran, Iran is deterred, that it seems to me the trouble will continue. And that especially applies to Hezbollah. Hezbollah has way more weaponry than Hamas. It can do much more damage to Israel. It can kill many more Israelis. The Israeli Defense Forces would love to take a preemptive uh, stab uh, at Hezbollah, but they're being told by the Americans you can't do that. This is a very, very dangerous situation. I personally would be surprised if it doesn't kick off at some point in, say, the next couple of months. Does the U.S. election actually uh, help U.S. 
call out Iran or not? Like, could it be something that helps him in the election or not help him? I, 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 I think it's difficult for Joe Biden or for any president to do anything bold in an election year. Uh, Joe Biden's in a quandary. Uh, if he does anything that seems to increase the risk of a major conflict in the region, then he's accused of starting another forever war. But if he does nothing, then he's accused of being weak. So it's very, very difficult to do foreign policy in an election year. And that's why I think the Biden administration has backed away from confrontation with Iran, has pretended Iran had nothing to do with any of this, when it's obvious that it does. You know, longer Sorry, time. I just want to go back to one thing that you said earlier on in a comment, that U.S. finds itself not wanting to get involved in forever faraway wars, but it constantly does. Right. So it's in this sort of box or an yes. image it's made of itself. How does it break out of that? I mean, in India, we've seen a prime minister break out of the old image of India, yeah. right? Is it possible for a leader to come in and do that? I think it's extremely uh, difficult. If you look at Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor's recent article uh, in Foreign Affairs, which sets out a quite sophisticated strategy for trying to contain China, he had to rewrite that article after it was published because of what happened on October the 7th. The original version said, we got the Middle East under control, nothing to worry about there. He had to completely rewrite it for the digital version, saying, okay, there was a little bit of a problem there <laughs> on reflection. And that's, that illustrates, I think, the American problem. They simultaneously have to keep an eye on Europe, they have to keep an eye on the Middle East, and they have to keep an eye on the Far East. Uh, that's a lot of commitments. That's basically a, a global commitment. But the mood of the electorate is, you know, after Iraq, after Afghanistan, we're kind of done. Can we not get involved? And even financial support, even sending arms to Ukraine, where not a single American soldier has been deployed, even that has caused a kind of political fatigue. It's like, this is the central problem. The United States has these responsibilities. It has all these troops still in the Middle East. Guess what? They're targets. Uh, but the electorate would really rather not be there. And the slogan, America first, that Donald Trump first adopted back in 2016, has also been used by Joe Biden. And that captures this sense that you get when you're in the United States, that people would rather focus on domestic issues like the economy, getting inflation down, and they really don't want to be bothered by countries they probably couldn't find on a map. What's your reading of what's most likely to happen in the United States in a potential Biden versus Trump duke? Uh, who do you think is likely to come out triumphant? Well, I think Donald Trump is highly likely to be the Republican nominee. He just cleaned up in the Iowa caucuses. I expect uh, there might be a little trouble in New Hampshire. That's always a tricky state. But I, I think he will have the nomination by Super Tuesday. And then it's going to be a very, very tight race. If you look at the swing states where this will be decided, there are about five states where it will be decided. It could be a couple of hundred thousand votes that determine whether Joe Biden gets a second term or Donald Trump gets a second term. Yeah. My gut at the moment is that it's, it's really Trump who's got, got the best shot. But it's very close. 55% probability, it's just a little bit better than a coin toss that he gets re-elected. What that means for the world, people here in Davos are only just beginning to think about. No, you tell us, what are you thinking about that? Because for every American, it's their number one concern. What could a second Trump presidency look like? What does that mean potentially for the rest of the world? Well, for the rest of the world, it'll mean some interesting changes. I've, as I've said, support for Ukraine is already in jeopardy long before Trump is back in the White House. But I think it's fair to say that it would not be good news for Ukraine if Trump won. He has no love for Zelensky, and he seems to have a kind of bromance with Vladimir Putin. So that seems like bad news for Ukraine. Probably good news for Israel. Trump's track record in Israel was pretty supportive, uh, had his hostility to Iran, uh, was very obvious. In many ways, Trump's Middle East policy was more successful than Biden's. So I think it would be good news on balance uh, for Israel, bad news for Iran. As for China, that's the big question. Trump really has been a, a proponent of tariffs, of a trade war. I'm not so sure Trump wants to get into an actual war with China. So it's a little less clear what it would mean uh, for Taiwan. But, you know, the bigger consequences of a Trump re-election are, are at home because it would call into question the very stability of the American Constitution. Remember, this is a man who called on a mob to march on the Capitol sure. to try to overturn the result of the last election, and he's running for re-election now. That's a pretty shocking indictment of the mood of American voters. In, in many another country, I think Trump's political career would have been over on January the 6th, 2021, and here he is, narrowly the front-runner in the prediction markets. So it's not so much the American empire that is at stake here, it's the American Republic itself. What about India? 
the relationship with India as Trump comes into power. There was quite a lot of bromance between Prime Minister and the President. Um, and Prime Minister has done very well with Biden as well. Yeah. But how do you think it will affect our relationship? Because there's a whole lot of talk about incredible India and inevitable India. Yeah. We can't stay away from India. So well, it's, it, it's been, I've heard the conversation for 20 years now. We've got to make India part of our Asia strategy. We have to kind of build a NATO in Asia to contain China. And it's become much more of a reality than it was when Bob Blackwell and others talked about it back in the early part of this century. And I think that owes a lot to Narendra Modi and his openness to being part of the Quad. I think the Quad is real. It's a really important part of American global strategy. Uh, but I always like to remind my American friends, the thing about India's relationship uh, with the United States is that it's highly contingent on the, the scenario. I don't really imagine India doing an awful lot if there's a conflict over Taiwan. Uh, because India's uh, conflicts with China are much closer to home. There's a border conflict there. There are economic reasons why India and China are at odds. So I don't think one should regard this as an alliance in which whatever happens, India will stand next to the United States. This isn't NATO uh, in the way that it is in Europe. Moreover, if you look at uh, the fact that uh, Mr. Modi is uh, an enthusiastic participant in BRICS summits, there's a sense in which he'd quite like to keep his options open. And that, I think, is the reality of India's situation. It's being wooed by the United States, but Narendra Modi knows that India has some options, and it doesn't need to make an unconditional commitment to American foreign policy. In the emerging world order at the moment, how are you looking at the India story and the prospects of India's rise on the global high table? Well, it's quite a few years now, but I remember back, I think, not long after 2008, making a prediction that it would be a bit like the fable of the tortoise and the hare. China then was the hare and India looked like the tortoise. And I said, looking at the demographics, it'll turn out to be the tortoise India that wins this race. Well, here we are in 2024. Everybody talks about China's slowdown, China deflation, and an Indian economic miracle. And there's no getting away from the fact that something has fundamentally changed. The India that I first got to know 20 years ago has it's begun to vanish. That India is being replaced by a new, extraordinarily dynamic India. Uh, and that's exciting. And, and who could be against that? What that means for ordinary Indians, millions and millions of ordinary people, is a massive improvement in their living standards. It's exciting. It's great. You'd be nuts to be against it. Uh, and this, of course, means that India becomes a geopolitical player in a way that it wasn't. Back in the Cold War, India was part of the non-aligned movement, which was annoying to Americans, but in the final analysis, not that important. Now India looks aligned. If anything, it's aligned with the United States. That's a really big issue in Cold War II. So I think this is a huge shift in the global balance of power, uh, not only economically, but also geopolitically. But from your lens, what aspects of India are you seeing vanish? What are the new aspects of India which are giving you the sense of optimism? Well, I think what's vanished is the sense that you can never do anything about India's infrastructure, which I, I remember being told repeatedly 20 years ago. And that turns out not to be true. In fact, you can transform it. And I think that's the first and most striking feature. The other thing that's remarkable is that fintech, which is something that seemed a very remote thing 20 years ago, when you would pay for things with some pretty mangled banknotes, you know, we now have India having leapt forward in fintech with, an international, uh, with a national system of payments that is really the envy of many countries in the Western world. So these are transformations that I don't remember anybody imagining 20 years ago. And they're creating, of course, opportunities for Indian businesses, not just in digital services. We kind of saw that coming maybe 10 years ago, but now also in manufacturing. Now, it's going to take a long time for Apple to shift its Chinese production to India. They've only done a very small amount of that. But, you know, that seems like a foreseeable future now in a way that it simply didn't two decades ago. Could AI be a silent factor that you haven't put in for China to re-emerge? Because, you know, it has been a bit quiet since Corona. And there's a lot of talk that they've been doing AI development and they are as far ahead as the U.S. Now, does that change the game suddenly for them? Or will well, they suddenly rise again, like the Phoenix? Kali, I'm not sure that it's right that, that, that China is uh, keeping pace with the United States in artificial intelligence. The story of the last couple of years has been massive breakthroughs with large language models and generative AI, and that's all been done by U.S. companies. Uh, the Chinese are far behind. 
and if you talk to people in Chinese tech, they'll admit that. And of course, it doesn't help that they can't get access to the most sophisticated semiconductors right. because of U.S. Uh, restrictions that, uh, that, that essentially make it impossible for people to sell those semiconductors to China. Mm -hmm. So I think in the AI race, China is in fact in trouble. So I don't think that's the answer. And indeed, when you look at the kind of policies that Xi Jinping has been pursuing, uh, if you look at the problems in, in real estate, if you look at the really dire demographics, uh, it's hard for me to see how China keeps its growth rate at anything close to 5% over the next 10 years. In fact, I'll predict here and now on this show that China's growth rate is going down to low single digits in the coming decade. That won't be true for India. So I go back to my earlier uh, prediction. India is going to overtake in terms of growth rate. Uh, China, it'll take a while to catch up in terms of aggregate gross domestic product. But it seems to me that that's the, that's the future of this century because India has all these advantages. And one other advantage, let's not forget, India is still a free society with a pretty free press and free elections. China has nothing like that. It's a one-party state with the old centralized Communist Party model. So that's another reason why I was an optimist about India 10, 12, uh, 15 years ago, and I remain an optimist. So you're long India, short China, and yes. everyone watching at this time is going to love what you said. But in terms of power dynamics, how do you see that play out? Five times larger economy than ours. They're building the biggest navy that the modern world has seen. And the low growth rates are now coming on the back of decades of some of the fastest yep. growth the world has seen. So how do you see this play out in terms of great power rising? Well, it's certainly true, and you're right to emphasize it, Rahul, that, that a huge amount of money has been spent and is being spent by China on defense. It's building a navy that in terms of numbers of boats is already the biggest in the world. It's building a nuclear arsenal, uh, which doesn't get nearly enough attention, but is a huge threat uh, to global stability investing in hypersonic missiles. Right now, if there were a showdown between the US and China over Taiwan, I would not put money on the US winning that showdown. In fact, if you look Where at some... Where would your money be? Well, China would be more likely to win in the hot war because... Even at this moment, not you, five years down? Right now, because if you look at the, the war games that have been done, one of the striking features is how quickly the US runs out of precision missiles in a week. Now, if you're going to run out of precision missiles in a week, you're not in a great shape to win a war like that. China's manufacturing capacity is now so much greater than the U.S., probably two times greater, that if it came to a hot war, China would have some real advantages. And that's why my strong advice to American policymakers is don't do this. Let's not have a showdown over Taiwan. You're not in the kind of position you were in back in the 1990s, the last time there was a Taiwan Strait crisis. So you think so, like, Taiwan becoming a part of mainland China is inevitable at some point in time, in your view? I hope not, because I, I love the fact that Taiwan is a free society. It's a true democracy. It shows that Chinese people can run a really exemplary democracy, and I long, long may its autonomy continue. But you have to ask yourself, if its autonomy depends on an American military guarantee, mm -hmm. how long can that last when the guarantee ceases to be credible? So I think China's investment in its military is a serious cause for disquiet. But it can't offset the fact that the economy is slowing, that you can't really fix the real estate sector, uh, that the demographics are terrible. There's a scenario in which the population halves between now and the end of the century. It's hard for me to see that China's power is there for the long term. And youth unemployment's past 20%. And they won't even publish the figures, so we don't know what it is today, but it's certainly above 20%. These are serious problems for Xi Jinping. Now, they may make him take strategic risk. Sometimes it's when things are going badly that authoritarian regimes do reckless things. We've just had an election in Taiwan. So far this week, nothing bad has happened. I'm not going to tempt fate by saying it's not going to happen, but it feels like we've probably avoided a crisis this year. But at some point in the next few years, I'm afraid there's bound to be a Taiwan crisis. And when that happens, that will be the real test of the U.S.-India relationship. Where will India be in that scenario? My guess is not picking up the phone. But kind of a, busy this weekend. But in a <laughs> historical sense, why do you think China, whose main concern is to take over Taiwan at some point in time from their security perspective, wants to keep a hot border with India across the line of actual control? Uh, Farid was here just where you are yesterday, just over 40 miles of glacial snow, mm. he said, you know, to raise the specter of 2.5 billion people up against each other. That's not very smart from China's perspective in the view of many here in Davos and elsewhere. Why are they doing it? It is, it is mysterious, but it's not, it's not the first time that the Chinese Communist Party has a, had created a kind of permanent state of insecurity 
on its border. It was something that happened with the Soviet Union, if you remember, in the late 1960s and came very close to a major war. So I think this is part of the Mao Zedong playbook uh, that Xi Jinping has quite uh, liked d dusting down and using. Uh, create tension with the neighbors, make sure that everybody at home realizes there could be some kind of conflict. I think it helps domestically. Uh, but strategically, you're right. It doesn't make a great deal of sense, and it just drives India closer to Washington, uh, which has to be an unintended consequence. And lastly, let's spend a moment on the future of money. You were a crypto <coughs> skeptic. For the last several months, it seemed that crypto was on its way out, and reality taught by professors in Stanford and elsewhere uh, was catching up. That this was never for real. Now it seems that crypto is making a bit of a bounce back. It's like the cockroach is there and you know it's not going away so how are you looking at what might happen from here on well I, my, my relationship to crypto is a kind of on-off romance <laughs> and i've i went through a period of being offered i i came to uh, see by 2018 that there really was something important going on here then i lost faith again over the sam bankman fried fiasco i think the exchanges were a major distraction from the possibilities of decentralized finance and financial technology generally i do think indeed i was at a breakfast discussing it this morning with Nurul Rabini. I think there's something very important evolving here. Bitcoin has survived the downfall of the exchanges, at least of, of FTX and Binance, and it increasingly looks like an option on digital gold, which you'd want to have in your portfolio. So it seems to me that crypto survived the near-death experience and that there's more to come. The age of decentralized finance is at a relatively early stage. So I've come, I've come back to a more bullish view probably belatedly, but that's where I am. So lastly, before we end, uh, your real romance. Um, you have defended her very valiantly on social media, though she needs no defending. Um, and that was fantastic. How do you deal with trolls? Because you are so out there, um, you know, airing your views and everyone wants to reply back. How do you deal with trolls? How did she think of her, your defense of her? Well, my wife, Ayan Hirsi Ali, uh, does not really need me to defend her. She's one of the most courageous women in the world. As somebody who's criticized Islamic extremism as a former Muslim, she has come in for not just trolling, but, but death threats uh, over the last 20 years. And it's been a part of our marriage to deal with those threats. Uh, but I think when it comes to online abuse, which has its own... Uh, its own impacts on, on any individual, uh, we've learned a simple rule. Uh, and, and it was one we discovered in 2020. I remember saying to Ayan, when we were looking at some negative uh, commentary on social media, would you let these people into our backyard? Would you let them into our garden? Of course not. So why are we letting them into our head? So the conclusion we drew was, do not look at what the trolls say. Don't look at what the comments say. Uh, look at what the people you follow say, fine. I mean, if I'm following somebody, I'm interested in what they have to say. And if they criticize me, I'm fine with that. But what these other people say, whether they're Russian bots or real people, I don't care about. And I don't think about it. I must say that has made our lives a great deal better. So that is the secret of anti-aging. Do not listen to trolls and I'm not. afraid I'm aging. You may not have noticed that this is gray hair on my chin. But it's, I'm certainly remaining sane that way. We hope you get in some skiing in Davos. Uh, we I'm know not you sure love I will. Skiing. Uh, we hope you get some skiing in. Well, this has been an absolutely fascinating conversation and your bullishness on India and the fact that your <laughs> shot on China is going to just uh, have people back home very, very excited. We hope to have you back with us again very soon. Thank you so much for but joining Just remember, I was long India long before it was fashionable. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Absolute pleasure. Thank you, sir.